morning all i welcome all the attendees who are attending this session hosted by additional skill acquisition program today we have with us dr mn parishuraman sir assistant professor in english university college trivandrum he will be handling the sessions on basic terms and concepts in english language teaching i welcome you sir to the session over to you sir good morning everybody uh this is my first online class in my life uh, i am a little nervous and a little bit unprepared uh, but then uh, please feel free uh, to ask me anything at any point um even uh, it could be at, in the question and answer session after this talk uh, or after 20 minutes of this talk or uh, you know it can even be later you can text me or mail me or whatever later anyway i'll introduce some basic terms and concepts in elt and uh, if we have some time i will also talk to you briefly about uh, elt in india uh, the origin and how the uh, the broad paradigms or the way english is taught in india the purposes policies etc have changed so we will begin with the basic terms and concepts uh, the first thing that uh, we need to know is l1 and l2 capital l1 uh, one is written as a subset uh, uh, sorry uh, as a subscript and uh, l2 capital l2 l1 is what is normally known as our mother tongue or our first language it is the language that we learn from our mother or our parents and uh, the latest uh, scientific research even suggests that that learning process begins even while we are in the mother's womb when we are still fetuses and uh, it continues throughout childhood and you know uh, if you it continues as long as you uh, live in an environment where that language is spoken and used in day to day transactions L2 is the language that you learn after that and uh, usually not always but usually L2 learning is more conscious it's more artificial okay uh, so and uh, the, the exception to this rule uh, which governs the learning of L1 and L2 is the phenomenon which is called uh, bilingualism i will uh, tell you a little more about bilingualism later uh, but uh, you have instances uh, particularly in india uh, in the borders of all our states particularly uh, where uh, you have people learning both you know two languages and in certain instances even three languages from very very early childhood and they learn both of them the same way functionally and consciously okay so uh, coming to the uh, the way in which l1 is learned okay the term used for this kind of learning there are two terms one is l1 learning and uh, the more accurate term which is used is acquisition l1 learning or acquisition and uh, the characteristics of acquisition are that one it is gradual okay you learn language not in a class or through classes or sessions or courses or deadlines but you learn it very gradually uh, without any fixed schedule without fixed times and places and it is natural you learn it uh, you know in the normal course of life it's not in a in an artificially created teaching learning situation but in the normal course of life we learn it from real life situations because we we need to live and function in this world and negotiate through this world right from early childhood right from the time we start speaking language uh, from the age of 2 or a little bit younger than 2 in fact and uh, we we learn to transact we learn to express our needs and to uh, we learn to learn things about our surroundings and all this happens through real life situations and uh, 
it's all mediated through language through l1 and it is unconscious we are not aware of the fact that we are learning language we are doing a lot of things day to day things and uh, incidentally and unconsciously language learning also happens so it's unconscious and uh, it's very uh, the uh, these L1 learning tends to be mostly learning of the spoken language, not so much the written language. Of course, with the, with the texting and you know modern technology, email and texting particularly, uh, you know there there is a lot of uh, written. But then uh, you know even that writing is not typical writing. It doesn't follow the conventions of writing. It's like speech. And now, of course, with the voice notes and so on available in, in texting technology, it has gone back to speech. Lots of people, even among my friends and acquaintances, they are more comfortable with sending voice notes than typing things out. And, and they keep sending, keep sending, keep sending. And uh, it is very uh, application-oriented learning. That is, we learn in order to uh, communicate and we communicate in order to achieve various objectives of day-to-day -day life and another feature of l1 learning is that we learn of course we learn from elders uh, we learn a lot from our peers from people of our own age and as we grow a little older we learn a lot even from younger people uh, in fact you know the structuralist linguists in america that, that if you want to learn about the future of a language, some of the directions that the future of any language, particularly the spoken form, is going to take, you should pay attention to the informal speech of younger people. So we learn uh, from all age groups, particularly from our own age group. And uh, very little of L1 learning happens from experts of course our mother tongue is taught in school you know we learn malayalam in school we learn the grammar and we learn some structure and those things but a lot more than what we learn in school or in college in the classroom we learn from life outside and that is mostly from non-professionals from non-experts they may be very good at the language they might be experts in an informal sense but they are not professionally trained experts. And uh, the emphasis, because it is mostly spoken language, you know, the, the areas that, are, that uh, come up for emphasis are in fact uh, pronunciation and rhythm and intonation. And the objective is effective communication, getting your message across. And because it's through listening and speaking, pronunciation, rhythm, and intonation, these things get a front seat. So these are all the features of acquisition or L1 learning. Now we come to L2 learning, which is simply called learning as opposed to acquisition. Um, L2 learning or learning, I'll, I'll call it learning so that you get used to the term. Uh, learning is very different from acquisition. And uh, when we are dealing with L2, the first thing, uh, usually, you know, I have pointed out to bilingualism earlier, but leaving aside those things, uh, usually it is a conscious process. We learn because we want to learn. We are conscious that we are trying to learn a language. And, uh, you know, the L2 is usually our second language. And uh, the learning is structured. It happens at designated times and places classroom a class period or hour you know 45 minutes or one hour or whatever it is and uh, there is a timetable certain days certain hours during the week and uh, uh, the learning process is also structured like even in a language classroom you know uh, after play school at least it's not just that we go and you know like children are just allowed to have spontaneous conversations that doesn't happen. There is some drilling and there is uh, control involved. And uh, there is an expert. There is a professionally trained person, you know, guiding and controlling the learning process. 
So all these things make it structured and it's artificial in the sense that it doesn't happen naturally. It doesn't happen as a part of our normal day-to-day -day life processes, but it is a situation which is set up, which is artificial. And the emphasis in L2 learning, of course, that is changing. Uh, particularly, you know, it, it has been changing since the 1960s in the West, in, uh, in countries where English is the mother tongue. And in India, it has been, we have been trying to change it from the 1980s. And uh, that changed the process of change. In, in Kerala, the process of change uh, picked up steam in this century. Uh, uh, that it has been changing. But again, you know, the emphasis in L2 learning is not so much on the spoken language and pronunciation and rhythm and intonation, but it is on the written language, uh, on grammar, using correct words and, and structure you know, getting your sentences structured properly, you know, every word in the right place, you know, particularly in English, uh, structure is very important because we don't have inflections. We don't have words, you know, the sound of words changing according to meaning, but then, uh, you know, the, the change in meaning comes from uh, the change of place in the sentence of the, uh, of the concerned word. Sorry. And uh, of course, there is conscious learning of vocabulary. You know, uh, we are introduced to dictionaries and other such things right from school. And we, we learn vocabulary even uh, in textbooks, school textbooks, even certain uh, basic college textbooks. You find that after a lesson, the lesson might be literature or social science or whatever, uh, but after the lesson, you know, you are given word meanings, you are given vocabulary. So there's constant, uh, there's conscious, uh, not constant, sorry, conscious teaching of vocabulary. Uh, this is learning as opposed to acquisition or L2 learning. And uh, interestingly, you have certain cases where uh, people uh, can become very good at an L2. They can become very good at an L2. They can achieve a high level of proficiency in writing, not just proficiency, but even depth and expertise, real knowledge, deep knowledge. Uh, but in, in speaking uh, the L2, they might still be heavily mother tongue in. Uh, two famous examples that I can give you in this regard are the English novelist, Joseph, the Polish national, Josef Konrad Kurzyniewski, and uh, he migrated to England and he became one of the best known writers in English, you know, who is admired for his style even by critics. Uh, he acquired that kind of depth in the written language and written expression. Uh, but till the end of his life, he was speaking English with the strong uh, Polish mother tongue interference. And another famous example is the Soviet communist uh, leader, Joseph Stalin, actually. He was Joseph uh, uh, Vissarionovich uh, Yugashville. And uh, he was Georgian by birth. His mother tongue was Georgian, but he became very well versed in Russian and Russian literature and learning. But he spoke Russian with strong Georgian inflections in the end of his life. And uh, one more thing to remember regarding learning or L2 learning is that, uh, of course, this is debated, but people say that the best age to do it is between the age of 10 and 16. Uh, when people acquire the kind of discipline and concentration span to sit down and undergo this kind of structured learning, uh, but they don't become self-conscious, which is something that happens, you know, with the teens and the late adolescents, 16 and so on. So 10 to 16 is said uh, by many linguists to be the optimum age for learning. Now coming to bilingualism. Bilingualism is when people learn uh, two languages and uh, they might learn two languages pretty well. They might have a fairly 
a detailed and deep understanding of uh, two, two uh, languages or it could even be multilingual it could be more than two languages even that is possible and uh, uh, we can be proud of the fact that in india you know the majority of the population is bilingual and uh, uh, there are plenty of people who are multilingual there are two types of bilingualism one is known as simultaneous bilingualism when you are exposed to uh, two languages from very early childhood from the time that you actually start learning and using language it could be because uh, uh, because you have parents speaking uh, two different languages it could be because while growing up you know you are exposed to one language from your parents and family members at home and another language uh, outside among your friends and in the street uh, it could sometimes even be because uh, the parents speak one language but then they are living in a place where that language is not the mother tongue but the kids have grown up with the, the language of that place where the parents have settled and they are more fluent in that language so you know uh, you speak one language with your parents and another one with your siblings and uh, you know that is another type of uh, simultaneous bilingualism but then the of course the key feature of simultaneous which is implicit in the word itself is that uh, it is happening you know the learning of two languages or the I, I i'm sorry i should say the acquisition of two languages is happening at the same time then you have what is known as sequential bilingualism sequential bilingualism is the process that we outlined earlier that is you learn one language uh, through acquisition naturally and gradually uh, in the process of living life and after that you learn a second language uh, in a structured way formally from trained experts you know and consciously because you want to learn a language that is known as sequential bilingualism one after the other then another related term is uh, diglossia. Diglossia is when you uh, speak uh, different varieties of a language, uh, depending on whom you are speaking to and what is the occasion, <coughs> sorry, and what is the context and other such things. Uh, so uh, uh, there you use different registers of the same language. Like, when you speak to your teacher or your boss, you use a certain kind of language. When you speak to, uh, to strangers who are of the same uh, social status or of a lower status, social status, you may use a different kind of language. When you speak to uh, children or people who are lower than you in social status or to your very close friends, you might use this could all be the same language but different varieties and even during the course of a single day you know uh, without being conscious of it you might be doing diglossia shifting between uh, different varieties of the same language from context to context another thing that happens in in language classrooms uh, particularly in the bilingual teaching method where uh, you know people teach language uh, through the mother tongue not entirely through the mother tongue but with the assistance of the mother tongue An another thing that happens is what is known as code switching that is in the course of a conversation uh, people might change from one language to another and it might happen repeatedly and frequently and of course, unconscious uh, code switching. This is also something which is very common in India, particularly among Indians who are comfortable with English. Uh, there is a lot of code switching happening all the time. Okay. Then another uh, basic term, basic uh, concept uh, that uh, I would like to introduce, I think it's part of module one of your English language teaching syllabus is uh, uh, 
teacher orientation and learner orientation. Normally, the L2 classroom or the L2 learning space, traditionally, uh, till the 60s in the West, and uh, uh, they speak when the teacher asks them questions to test their knowledge or to, uh, to test uh, the amount of learning that they have acquired, either in terms of questions in the class or uh, small class activities or experiments, very short ones, or uh, through written tests and examinations. So on, uh, but most of the TTT, the to uh, TTT, the total talk time, is uh, the teachers, and uh, that is uh, the teacher oriented uh, oriented classroom and uh, teacher orientation in uh, English language teaching. And uh, from the uh, uh, from the nineteen uh, sixties in the West and. Uh, uh, the 1980s in India, uh, maybe later, it varied from in situation to situation because India is a big country and uh, ELT situations are not uniform by any means. Uh, there are so many levels. Uh, there are vertical variations uh, depending on level, you know, school, college, university, and uh, horizontal variations depending on region and uh, whether it's an urban space or a semi urban or a rural space. Space. towards making uh, classrooms and learning situations more learner oriented because uh, the you know this was in uh, parallel or in tandem with the shift from the uh, the classical grammar translation approach i'll be coming to that next okay uh, from the gram grammar translation method the classical approach to the communicative paradigm or the communication based approach and uh, the communication-based approach laid an emphasis on uh, students or learners, even of an L2, being able to communicate effectively in that language and eventually, uh, you know, learning to use a language in practical, real-life situations, if not in school itself, you know, at least later on in their working career. Uh, you know, whether in the private sector or the government sector, wherever it might be. Uh, so uh, people felt that if you want to teach communication, you know, if you want to uh, swim, you have to get into a river or a water body and start swimming. Uh, you can't learn without that. And they said, if you want to teach communication, you need to actually get the learners to communicate. So uh, that it definitely meant that uh, the teacher had to give up uh, some of his or her own talk time and uh, the teacher became less of an instructor and more of a facilitator you know the students do the communication they do the learning and uh, l2 learning or learning uh, tries to imitate acquisition in terms of process uh, but whatever classical teacher oriented classroom the learner oriented classroom your simple and contemporary language and activities role plays kits and the teacher would just be you know uh, or uh, if you want it's i find it funny but then you know uh, it has its meaning like uh, if you want to use a very typical malayali elt term you know uh, a scaffold a lot of people say scaffolder, you know, scaffolder is very undramatic, uh, but a scaffold, you know, uh, what a scaffold is, uh, is a temporary support, which is given to a building when the building is still under construction. And uh, the teacher becomes a scaffold for the learner when the learner is still constructing his or her knowledge of the L2. And uh, the, uh, the ideal was, of course, that uh, learning should imitate acquisition. Or in other words, L2 learning should imitate or mimic L2 and becomes deeper and more practical, more communicative. So this was the shift that we saw from teacher orientation to learner orientation. And it is reflected even in the syllabi. In Kerala, for instance, you know, till 2009, Shakespeare and Keats and Shelley were being part of, they were prescribed as a part of general English. 
But then uh, 2009, when there was a slew of reforms in higher education, when we switched over to the credit and semester system, and all these things, even the material uh, gradually changed to material which is in uh, contemporary English and which is not necessarily confined to literature, you know, getting deep into the nuances of a language, you know, nuances which you may not need in, in an Indian context, but getting into the more practical and career oriented, useful things, you know, from contemporary writing, uh, not necessarily literary, but even scientific, social scientific, environmentalist, etc. So uh, that is the change that we, that, that is the change from teacher orientation to learner orientation that we have seen reflected in syllabi. And uh, I already talked to you about uh, how it was reflected in the actual talk time in the classroom, the type of uh, classroom activities. And of course, one area in which uh, unfortunately, uh, you know, universities have not yet found a sufficient way to reflect this change is, of course, in the examination structure. The, you know, our examinations are very still predominantly memory based and uh, examining uh, grammar proficiency, and, uh, writing skill rather than speaking skill. But then uh, let us hope that uh, uh, a day will come when it will be possible to have exams also, which actually test the uh, the actual communication skill of the learner and uh, not the literally the writing aspect of it. In fact, one modest step in this direction uh, with effect academic year, I'm, I'm talking about 2019-20 uh, academic year when the, the first semester uh, English exam for all degree students under Kerala University. Uh, the, in one paper, in one course, the internal assessment for 20 marks, 15 marks, you minus five for attendance, 15 marks was in the in the form of a of a spoken viva rather than a written test. So that is uh, so uh, these changes are gradually happening, and we are trying to bring. Uh, learner orientation, uh, not just in the classroom space, but in the evaluative technique and everywhere. We are trying to bring it across the board. The process is happening, though a little slowly. OK, now, uh, having gone over all these uh, ELT basic terms and concepts, uh, I would like to uh, pause here, uh, do, you know, in case uh, some of you have any questions or comments? Okay, the moderator has not hit the pause button, so I assume that there are no questions no, at this stage. No, no. Hello, sir. Just one question till now. That is, he. Yes. Uh, it's from Jacob Kunnat. Uh, he want to uh, know code switching again. Can you explain code switching again, sir? Okay, code switching is basically. Uh, changing from one language to the other and changing back you know it can happen several times during the course of a conversation uh, it is common among uh, uh, people who have a mother tongue that is not english but who have been educated in the english medium and uh, into whose life and uh, usage english has come in in a big way and it can happen for a variety of reasons. You know, uh, there are some thoughts and concepts that people might be more comfortable expressing in English. And these could come up in the middle of a conversation where uh, most of the transaction between two people is happening in the mother tongue. But English could make an appearance once in a way uh, for certain ideas when dealing with certain ideas. It happens sometimes when people want to uh, underline something, to give something a certain gravity and seriousness when they say certain things. Uh, these are the situations normally where it happens in a conversation between people. And there is a lot of code switching in uh, L2 classrooms, uh, 
because uh, a lot of teachers they use the bilingual method partially or wholly uh, to help the learners to get a grip on uh, the L2 and they might explain certain concepts or they might uh, translate certain words or proverbs or so on into uh, into the uh, mother tongue into the L1 of the learner and then they may go back to English and this may happen more than once uh, during the uh, course of a uh, classroom uh, during the course of a class uh, so this is uh, uh, code switching. Uh, I hope uh, the whole thing is clear, like you got the whole thing. Hello? Yeah. Uh, sure, sir. You can continue with the session. Okay. Somebody had asked me a question. I saw a message coming up about SR theories. Uh, uh, should I deal with it now or should I keep it for the end of the session? We'll discuss that at the end, sir. Okay, okay. Uh, so coming to uh, the shift in uh, language teaching paradigms, you know, uh, the classic language teaching paradigm was dominated by the grammar translation method. Uh, it evolved in Europe, you know, uh, in the 16th century or so. I used to have the name and date of the person who... Hello? Uh, brought in uh, brought the term into existence brought the method into existence but unfortunately it slips my memory now uh, anyway uh, so the uh, the uh, the method of learning was mostly through writing and reading and the learning material was mostly mostly of a literary nature because literature the literature in a language written literature in a language was considered to be uh, the best example of usage of that particular language. And uh, people were given passages to translate from L1 to L2, and sometimes the reverse. Uh, and, uh, you know, people were taught uh, rules of grammar and structure. And uh, people were uh, taught uh, so people were given literary passages and uh, they were taught rules of grammar and structure and uh, the testing also used to be in terms of how well they had learned those rules. So there would be explanations of grammatical concepts and categories. There would be examples, illustrative examples given. And uh, then uh, there would be exercises for people to uh, to drill uh, their uh, understanding of these rules and learn to apply them correctly. And this was very dominant in the education system. I would say in India, it was dominant even till, till the 21st century, uh, you know, I, I would say. And, uh, you know, uh, textbooks like Ren and Martin and so on, you know, they were the classic example of this method and this paradigm it has its value of course it has its discipline the amount of drill and practice you get is very good and uh, in a situation where you don't have uh, exposure natural day-to-day -day life real life exposure to the l2 uh, you know where you have very little exposure to it which is the case in uh, most places in India, it has its value and its place. Uh, but there was a shift in the 60s in the West and uh, starting in the 80s in India and picking up pace now uh, to make language more uh, communicative. And I, I discussed a lot of these things in connection with learner orientation. So I'm not uh, getting into detail uh, now on that but uh, some of the uh, some aspects are worth looking at again and you know some of them might be repetitive but they are important please bear with me so the emphasis now uh, in the communicative paradigm there are a lot of methods and uh, there are a lot of uh, differences in approach even in the communicative paradigm you know you have a whole lot of methods your entire module 2 of the kerala university 
is all about methods actually i i won't be getting into methods uh, but then the the broad paradigm you know after the grammar translation method and the classical paradigm the broad paradigm emphasized certain things one is that language was primarily a method for communication and communication as it happens in real life not poetry or drama or other forms of you know uh, literary forms classical literary forms but in real life uh, in real day to day functioning you know there was a context to this uh, after the second world war there were a very large number of people uh, whose mother tongue was not eight, nine, and eight, nine, whose nationality was not english or american who had who were needed and who had gone to england and america uh, to seek employment and they had to be taught english and they had to be taught to learn to function in english there was no point in teaching them shakespeare and poetry so uh, people started uh, you know emphasizing uh, communication and functional communication in language teaching and uh, one thing in the communicative approach is you know again it came out of this particular concept or uh, context of people from different uh, linguistic groups and nationalities uh, you know getting into the english speaking countries and seeking to work there and live there and settle there and uh, so uh, there was a great diversity of culture diversity of background and diversity of uh, language because every language you know represents a different way of looking at the world and uh, language structures your thought your thought process your life the way you look at life the way you look at relationships all these things to a great extent and there is a diversity in all this so uh, the communicative classroom or the classroom in the communicative paradigm uh, insisted that diversity should be accepted and even celebrated uh, it is not something to be eliminated you know by enforcing uh one set of uniform rules or processes or you accept uh, diversity and the testing of people in this paradigm was again uh, you know for communication and practical learning and it was not uh, testing you know uh, where the the yardstick or the parameter was not some literary text or some so called perfect sample of usage of that particular language but it was very relative you know like a learner would be assessed you know largely against himself or herself like you join an english class you you don't speak english you join an english class and uh, you speak on the first day the second day and after one month how far have you traveled how much more comfortably are you able to use it after 3 months how much more comfortable after how 6 months 1 year 2 years whatever it may be so the uh, the testing of learning you know became more relative and uh, the learners were in a sense they, they were judged against themselves and their own previous uh, level of proficiency and uh, performance in communication and competence was judged relatively there was no yardstick in terms of a perfect piece of literature and literary interpretation but the yardstick was a whole lot of uh, real life or imitation simulated real life communicative situations and uh, multiple varieties of uh, english began to be recognized during this period because people were coming from various backgrounds and in pronunciation in vocabulary in structure in usage as people picked up english as l2 uh, l2 learning happened you know they would inflect the language they would change the language adapt the language in uh, their own ways to suit their own uh, the structures of their own culture their own l1 uh, set mental set and you know so that brought about a certain uh, diversity in vocabulary i'll give you an interesting example uh, 
uh, in uh, African English, for example, uh, it was originally in African English and now it has become universal. You know, the use of the word disappeared. You know, disappear is a verb and disappeared is traditionally considered the, the past uh, tense of uh, disappear. And disappear means to, uh, to go away from appearance, to no longer be seen or heard. And, uh, you know, uh, but in, uh, in a colonial context where, you know, uh, police used to pick up people, suspected criminals, political dissidents and others, and they used to take them away and kill them or deport them. And these people would suddenly go out of sight and out of hearing. And, uh, you know, Africans started saying that these people had disappeared. So from being, a, uh, from being a state of being or a passive verb, uh, disappear became an active verb. It became the verb for an action. And that gradually became very wide, widely accepted initially in African English and uh, eventually in English all over the world. And now you have that meaning of disappear even in the Oxford and Webster dictionaries. Uh, and that comes from a certain uh, historical and cultural context and encounter. And uh, so uh, things like that started coming into existence and multiple varieties of English in terms of pronunciation, structure and so on, uh, began to be recognized and respected in the communicative classroom. And they were accepted to the extent that, you know, so long as you could make yourself understood to the other participants in the classroom and eventually to other participants in real life situations that you would be facing. Uh, grammar and structure and purity of grammar and structure were not so important. Uh, so this uh, was another principle that gradually came to be accepted. You know, multiple varieties recognized. And today, you know, we even study it formally, that there are multiple varieties. Of course, we still speak primarily of the British and uh, American and uh, Australian variety. But, uh, you know, now it's been recognized that there is an Indian variety, many Indian varieties, in fact, and uh, many African varieties and other Asian varieties and so on. Okay. And the culture of the learner was uh, considered in this and there was no another uh, shift was that there was no single methodology anymore in the language learning classroom in the language learning situation because depending on the proficiency level of the learner the age of the learner the cultural background the various affective factors or blocks mental blocks that the learner might be facing uh, in the language learning process uh, you know, and the previous exposure to language and communication, depending on that, you know, different methods were necessary. And depending on uh, the amount of progress that the learner had made, it, it was found necessary to change the method. Like, uh, you know, I had earlier talked about a move, you know, starting with teacher orientation and moving towards learner orientation. You know, and you also had other similar moves, like starting with bilingualism and then moving towards total immersion. That is the technique where the learners are not allowed to use a single word of uh, L1 in the L2 classroom. Either they use the L2, you know, correctly or wrongly, in whatever way they know it, or they use sign language and mimicry in the you know, uh, so there was a movement from bilingualism with the teacher as a scaffolding and, you know, to, uh, to total immersion. And, uh, you know, things like that. So methodology changed, you know, as the learner became more advanced and uh, more and more capable of clear speech and uh, comfortable uh, communication in the language, you know, there would be a slow shift to uh, more writing and uh, specific, you know, written and formal functional aspects of the language. So the methodology could change, you know, from class to class, from time to time, from stage to stage, from learner to learner. 
so uh, there was no single methodology and uh, in fact now you know this uh, process has advanced so far that today in elt studies and seminars people uh, are no longer talking about methods but they are talking about the post method era they say that we are living in a post method elt era where it's not one method but a variety of methods which are chosen you know depending on the time and place and the learner and the situation uh, so uh, the, this was another principle no single methodology and learning became very active you know, i talked about immersion that is one way in which the learner was forced to become active and earlier i when talking about learner orientation i told you about role play and group discussions and skits and debates and various things to make the learner more active and for small children you know you would even have uh, dance and costume and you know the uh, tps uh, tpr method total physical response i am not uh, much of an expert on methods i won't get deep into methods now but uh, tpr is an important method where you know the whole body of the learner is uh, involved in the learning process and uh, this is an online classroom so i can't give you a demo uh, had it been a live classroom i could have given you a demo of how you know certain language uh, you know certain linguistic concepts and words are taught through actual learning you know through a dance yeah. jumping and turning around and yeah. all those things yeah. but unfortunately in an online situation those things can't be uh, done i want to say some conclusion in words you can say that after that we'll go to the uh, questions no i was just about to say that this is all about active learning whatever i said you know learning becoming very active uh, with small learners you know young very young learners involving the body and uh, with older learners to body to a lesser extent you know sign language gestures mimicry etc and uh, with others you know speech but more speech more tt to the learner rather than speech active learning yeah uh, i think that kinds of uh, that kind of winds it up i was prepared with a little bit of material on uh, elt in india also but then we have come to the end of time and you know i i wouldn't be able to cover all that you know in a very short time even if i were given 5 minutes so better i take the question yeah uh, so one more question can you just uh, brief about the common questions important questions that come for uh, university exams uh university exams okay in the portion that i have covered uh, i'll just go over it yeah um l1 and l2 usually you get a very short question you know, two marks or something or it, it could be clubbed and there could be a four mark or five mark question i don't remember the structure on l1 and l2 together uh you could get a five mark four or five mark question five mark i guess for an l uh, five mark question on the differences between l1 and l2 uh, you can get a uh, either a two mark or a five mark question on bilingualism uh, you can get a five mark or a full length essay question on acquisition and learning uh, you know if it and learning or l1 learning and l2 learning as they are otherwise known if if it is separate questions that could be like five marks each or if they are clubbed together and you are asked to bring out the uh, similarities and differences between acquisition and learning it could even be a full length essay question and uh, yeah bilingualism yeah i mentioned that you can get a two either a two mark or a five mark one on that diglossia and code switching for two marks and teacher and learner orientation uh, could be either five marks or a full length essay if it is a full length essay you would need to talk about methods also to some extent uh, grammar translation method uh, would normally be for five marks but uh, there is a possibility of an essay you would have to go into some detail some history and uh, 
the communicative approach could be uh, five marks or an essay and under the uh, communicative approach you can get uh, active learning and uh, varieties of English. Uh, the, I think the earlier question was about code switching. Uh, one more person has asked the same question. Can you explain once more? Uh, code switching is basically uh, changing over from one language to another during the course of a conversation. Uh, it could be, you know, in, in the Kerala context from English to Malayalam and back. Uh, or, you know, if it is a conversation between Malayalis who have grown up in North India, it could be from Malayalam to Hindi and back. Or, uh, you know, if they are English educated Malayalis in North India, it could be Malayalam to English to Hindi and uh, back and, you know, different ways. And it can happen, you know, once, twice or any number of times during a conversation, depending on the duration of the conversation. And it normally happens because the learners are comfortable. They are very comfortable and very familiar with uh, more than one language. It can happen, you know, if a discussion in the mother tongue takes a technical turn and uh, you suddenly need to explain a lot of uh, technical concepts. Like, you know, right now we are talking about COVID and lockdown. You know, we, we may begin a conversation on COVID in Malayalam. And then, you know, if we get deep into the medical side of it, uh, there could be code switching into English when you are talking about infection and herd immunity and asymptomatic carrier, all those things that can happen. It can happen at the level of words or it can happen at the level of entire utterances. And sometimes it can happen during the course of a conversation when you want to underline something and give it importance and, you know, uh, so you might uh, say that thing in the L1 and then you might say it in the uh, L2 to, to underline that this is not of it. Uh, it could happen that way, you know. Uh, so these are things that happen in uh, conversations or, you know, the, there are some instances where in a, in a Malayalam conversation, people bring in an English proverb or a quotation to make a point. Uh, this is in conversation. Another very common uh, place where code switching happens is, of course, in the L2 class. Just explain concepts in the mother tongue sometimes when the learners are very new and, you know, they really don't have any capital in the, in the L2 class. Teachers need to explain things in the mother tongue and then they may switch back into the L2 because ultimately the learners should become comfortable with the L2. They should not slip back entirely into the mother tongue because they, after all, they are tested in the L2. They are not tested in the L1. So, uh, but it happens in the, uh, in the classroom where bilingualism is used either partially or to a substantial extent. So uh, this is code switching and uh, these are the contexts in which it happens. Yeah, I hope that answers the question. Thank you. Hello. So there's another question. Uh, yeah. Is there any difference between diglossia and register? Uh, it's a subtle difference. Diglossia refers to the entire process of uh, uh, changing from one type of language to another, depending on whom you are speaking to and the relative uh, social status of the people involved in the conversation or the relative age and various other factors or, you know, the intimacy or the situation in which the conversation is taking place. If it is a formal function, you know, where you are speaking on stage, it would be different. If it is an informal conversation, it would be diffused in a certain profession. Uh, a very common example, since uh, all the students here have studied uh, Shakespeare's sonnet, I think uh, number 130, where he uses a legal register. 
you know, he says sessions and summoned and various things from the legal profession. So there are a whole lot of uh, terms coming in from a certain profession, which are uh, essential and common, you know, in any conversation and discussion in that profession. So when you are talking to your co-professionals, you use a certain register, certain words, certain concepts, uh, certain terms, they come up again and again, and they define what is known as a register. So uh, a register is the type of language, type of vocabulary, which is used in a certain professional circle. Diglossia is very broad. Hello, sir. Uh, yes. uh, I think we'll wind up the session because it's time. So thank you so much, sir. Even though we had technical issues, you handled the sessions really well. Uh, thank you, thank you so, so much. much. Please give them my phone number. Sure, sir. We'll uh, share your number also. They can feel free to call or text me 24 into 7. And sure, sir. So thank you. Uh, thank you all the attendees for uh, uh, seeing our session. Yeah, thank, thank you, so you very much, all the attendees. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much for this opportunity.